Well, July was a bit of an odd one for a few reasons, not least because we've now got our Mixergy IHP cylinder installed, which is very exciting, and I'm looking forward to showing you some of the early stats for that. I'm actually going to do a much more detailed stats analysis on the IHP. So in this video, it's only going to be the very high level uh, numbers. Um, so yeah, look forward to that video coming soon in the future. Um, but let's get on with it, shall we? So this is the Give Energy monthly report for our system, and it suggests that we generated 729.4 kilowatt hours. However, I know that that is a bit of an overestimate because look at this day here, the 18th of July. It suggested we generated 44.87 kilowatt hours on that day. Now I know that is absolute rubbish. There's no way we generated that much. That's an exceptionally high day, way higher than even the highest that we've had in previous months. Um, but uh, the real reason for that was um, something very strange happened to the inverter on that day. You can see this is the plot. At around about four o'clock when uh, the Octopus kicked in the force export from our battery, it looked like the generation dropped to zero and it remained zero for the rest of the day. And in fact, uh, the battery continued to discharge all the way down to, uh, well, half past seven here, and it got down as low as 7%. Now, at this point, I realized something weird was going on, so I tried to stop the force discharge. It should have stopped at 20%, as it normally does. Uh, I couldn't prevent that from happening, and uh, ultimately, it then completely discharged the battery all the way down to zero. Uh, at this point, I thought, well, okay, I I've got literally nothing to lose, so I actually did a firmware update on the inverter because it was in need of a firmware update and that then fixed it fixed everything octopus were able to take control of the inverter again and it then um, charged the battery back up to about 17 percent here and all was well from then on however it meant that the data for that day for some reason got really corrupted so some very strange things happened you can see this is the battery charge and discharge plot and for the 18th you can see uh, it was charged and discharged more than twice what it should have been but that isn't actually what happened there's no way that it actually charged double or discharged double it charged and ch discharged a little bit more than normal but certainly not double and our uh, consumption level was also way up on what it would normally be these big spikes here are when we um, charge the car um, but we didn't charge the car on the 18th and you can see that that's nearly double as well so I know something very strange happened on the 18th for the data so what I've had to do with the rest of this uh, video is actually massage the data slightly I've uh, manually corrected the data for the 18th um, from 44 kilowatt hours of generation down to about 25 something in that ballpark and um, so I've reduced the total generation down to more like 708 um, I'll show you that in a second and again I've had to uh, manually essentially guess what the consumption level would have been and thankfully the battery charge and discharge is pretty consistent from one day to the next so I basically essentially estimated that from the other days around it so uh, yeah for the rest of this um, I'm uh, I'm going to use my estimated values for that day to correct for that dodgy uh, <laughs> day of uh, strange data um, I'll just show you briefly the energy flow diagram this is much the same as it's always been uh, since we moved over to intelligent flux you can see that essentially the solar is not really um, going into the battery at all, only a tiny, tiny little bit. Um, so the battery is getting charged from the grid and then the battery is uh, getting discharged uh, back to the grid. So uh, getting charged up from the grid there, getting discharged um, back to the grid there along with most of the solar. And a little bit of the solar goes into the home and the rest of it is coming from the grid. And that's all standard and what you expect on intelligent flux. Um, so there you go. So that's the, uh, the basic report. Let's move on to the other stuff. So after correcting for that dodgy day's worth of data, I reckoned we actually generated closer to 708 kilowatt hours in July. It's actually a little bit lower than we would normally expect based on the PVGIS estimate in that blue shaded area there, but it's slightly above the minus one standard deviation line. So, you know, it's probably within the realms of what we would normally expect um, given the natural variation from one month to the next. However, we did generate slightly more than last year, which was a, a dreadful 666.62 kilowatt hours. So, you know, slightly better than last year, a bit down on what I would hope for. So, you know, swings and roundabouts. We did all right in June and May. So uh, I think on average, we're looking OK for the year so far. Now, I know what you're all wondering. Were there any fondant fancy days in July? Well, this was the closest we got on the 29th. You can see this pretty much unbroken curve right the way up until the afternoon at about half past five. We've got a couple of little clouds going across. But otherwise, that's the best fondant fancy day we've had in a while. You can see the two strings here uh, combining the east-west array um, giving us this uh, weird shape that we tend to get and that gave us a total uh, generation of 33.2 uh, kilowatt hours for the 29th of July. 
So this is where things start to get a little bit more interesting. This is the monthly consumption by month and category for the last 13 months. Um, and you can see for July, we actually use the EV more than we have done since January, in fact. A um, little bit higher than normal because we did a few longer trips in Cat's Fiat 500e. But the more interesting thing that I want to show you is actually the hot water, which um, here shows 59.07 kilowatt hours, uh, which is way down on the previous month of 90, where we actually went away for a week. So that was um, unnaturally low anyway. And before that, 122, 155, 134, 158. This is way down. Now, that is because we had the Mixed G IHP cylinder installed on the 11th of July, which meant that the first nine or 10 days, I think it was only nine days, we actually used um, the immersion heater. And the immersion heater actually used 34 0.3 kilowatt hours in that first nine days uh, and since we had the um, IHP installed we've only used 24.77 kilowatt hours for the subsequent 21 days of July that the IHP was operating. So um, I, I'm, as I said before I'm going to do a full uh, deep dive on the the stats for the IHP once, uh, once I've got a, a, a nice amount of data to show you um, but it seems to be operating more or less exactly how we hoped. Um, we're using about a third the amount of energy that we were using before for each day of uh, hot water. So uh, that's great and um, that's exactly what we were hoping for. Um, so that means that uh, for the every month going forward from here we should be um, significantly lower than this. It's going to be closer to um, 30 to 40 kilowatt hours per month hopefully for the next couple of months. It'll probably creep up a little bit as we go into winter and the, the water gets colder going into the cylinder so it needs a bit more energy to heat up um, and the coefficient of performance will probably drop a little bit over the winter as well. Um, but yeah I'm looking forward to seeing how the cylinder performs over the next few months and uh, into the winter. Um, but in total uh, we consumed a, a total of 452 uh, kilowatt hours mostly driven by the uh, the exceptionally high or I say exceptionally high 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 for us anyway EV use but counted a little, a little bit by the lower hot water use so uh, yeah it's all looking good so consuming about 450 kilowatt hours and generating just over 700 kilowatt hours puts us in this sort of ballpark in my rule of thumb chart here about 1.6 1.57 I think it was something like that but look at this all of these three tariffs are all basically on top of each other for uh, for this particular ratio of generation to consumption, um, which means uh, ostensibly it probably doesn't really matter what tariff we're on. Um, but let's have a quick look and see anyway. Uh, this is what the uh, comparison looks like. Uh, we are obviously on intelligent flux and my rule of thumb suggested we would save, uh, we would get a payout of £54. But look at this, the uh, intelligent go tariff would have paid us um, according to my rule of thumb, £55 and regular flux £51. Cozy would have been 38 and uh, go, well, we would have paid about 61 pence. But what actually happened based on the actual half, half hourly metered data from Octopus suggested that we actually received um, a power of £49 instead of what uh, my rule of thumb suggested of 54 uh, if we'd been on regular flux, it actually would have been slightly higher at £51.38 and Intelligent Go, amazingly, would have been £66 paid out to us. So the reason that the Intelligent Go value is so good here relative to what my rule of thumb suggested is, that, is because we actually exported way more than what we generated. So here we exported 872 kilowatt hours whereas we generated only 708 kilowatt hours. So there's a you know there's an extra 160 odd kilowatt hours there which were exported over and above what we generated. Now that's obviously all coming from cycling the battery, charging the battery up and then discharging it um, during the day. Uh, now that means that the uh, difference between the import of 7 pence on Intelligent Go and the export of 15 pence means that that extra export gives you that little bit of extra um, earnings there. That's because we've got such a large battery. We've got um, over 14 kilowatt hours of battery which is you know more than we would typically use in a given day which means that we can actually um, use that to force export more than we normally would. So this is what I was saying last month when I suggested that if you have a very large battery you can actually bump up the Intelligent Go uh, payout relative to what the rule of thumb suggests and that's uh, borne out by uh, this particular example here. Now I can't yet get Intelligent Go. Um, I would love to switch to Intelligent Go but uh, I don't have a compatible EV or charger. I'm hoping that the Give Energy EV charger will become compatible with Intelligent Go before the winter um, but for now I'm doing okay on Intelligent Flux. I'm actually considering switching to Flux in September, regular Flux from Intelligent Flux because the ratio of um, generation to consumption is going to start dropping down this direction you know as the as the uh, the days get shorter which suggests that Flux will be better for me for a little bit anyway. 
and I'm hoping that that will give me a little bit of margin of error so that once we end up um, in the winter by then hopefully you know when we're down here somewhere the Intelligent Go tariff will be uh, available to me here's hoping uh, you never know um, but that's my plan we'll see what happens um, otherwise you know maybe I'll switch to regular go once uh, once it gets really cold and dark and uh, you know we need to put the heating on it's uh, between if, if the choice is between intelligent go and go and if I can't get intelligent go then I have to have regular go so uh, yeah we'll see what happens and finally, here's the financial report for the last 13 months. Now, I've uh, shrunk my head down a little bit so that you can see what I've added here. These um, these new values in brackets after each of these categories is the last sort of rolling 12 months totals. So uh, everything from uh, July um, back to August last year. So uh, the, these last uh, 12 months, I've uh, included 13 months in the chart just so that you can see the direct comparison between July this year and July last year. And you can see actually our total bill for July is very similar in fact um, to last year. £49 uh, paid out to us in July this year. Uh, July and uh, it was £50 last July um, so yeah pretty similar and in fact the uh, the um, estimated total savings aren't that dissimilar either um, just over £200 this July which is very similar to June and um, May in fact um, but also again similar to last July and last August uh, £200 roughly saved each month which means our total savings for the last 12 months is about £2,060 which is uh, really cool. Uh, our total bill um, for the last 12 months would, would have been £364.59. You can add that on to the DFS savings so these are the um, uh, demand flexibility service sessions that we took part in. Um, we uh, earned ourselves £103. So our total bill, uh, if you add on the DFS to the, the total bill, um, it's something in the region of £260. So yep, pretty pleased with that. I'm, uh, I was hoping to get to a net zero bill. Uh, I don't think it's going to quite happen. Although now that we've got the IHP cylinder, our um, consumption of hot water is a lot lower, which means we might start seeing the savings creep up a little bit. Uh, we shall see. So uh, yeah, I, it'll, it'll, I don't know if we're going to completely uh, get to zero based on that. Um, but yeah, we'll see over the next few months, I guess. So yeah, looking forward to showing you all that data. So that was my monthly solar and stats update for July 2024. I'm hoping next week to do another Mixergy IHP cylinder video uh, concentrating on the install and running costs. So if you're interested in that, tune in next week. Uh, but in the meantime, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.